have a good understanding of what these various devices offer you. And we're talking about ECMO, we're talking about Mars. We've got two distinguished uh, faculty members are talking about this. The first will be Rob Subramanian, and Rob is going to be talking about Mars, which is kind of detoxification of the liver. Uh, it's almost like the liver dialysis. And Rob has got his training. He was at the University of Chicago, did his residency at the University of Chicago, and did fellowship at the University of Nebraska. And then that was in transplant fellowship, and then did pulmonary and critical care fellowship at the University of Chicago, and then did a GI fellowship at the University of Chicago. As I read these two guys' CVs, I thought, God, these guys have been to school all their life and, and had multiple degrees. But then if we look at Jim Bloom, who is the other speaker, and Jim will be talking about ECMO. And Jim also uh, comes in with multiple degrees and was recruited here to, to build the ECMO program and make it into an adult program. And so uh, he came in and has done a phenomenal job of trying to get that whole system set up. And if you look at Jim, he was uh, thought to be an anesthesiologist and an in interventionist, uh, intensivist, excuse me. He did his original training at Johns Hopkins and then came to the University of Michigan where he did his anesthesia fellowship and then stayed there and did critical care m fellowship and then joined the faculty at M Michigan and then finally we were able to convince him to come here. So we look forward to hearing from both of you guys. Rob, I'll start with you. Uh, Dr. Morris, thank you for that introduction. Um, so before I get started, I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge and thank uh, many departments in, at Emory who have made Mars a possibility at, at, uh, at our institution. We are currently uh, the leader in North America with respect to artificial liver support. And I think uh, it is, and that is because we've had support from the Emory Transplant Center, the Emory Center for Critical Care, my colleagues in hepatology, nephrology, intensive care, and also the passion of the intensive care nurses that has uh, made this possible is, needs to be acknowledged. So just a word of thanks to uh, a lot of folks in the crowd as well who have made this happen. So I want to start with a case, and this is a case from about four years ago. It's a lady with severe acute liver failure. So a 40-year-old, no significant past medical history, gets transferred from an outside hospital with worsening jaundice and fatigue. These are initial labs. She's got a coagulopathy, an INR of two and a half, transaminitis, severely jaundiced with a bilirubin of 20. And then she starts developing the uh, consequences of severe acute liver failure. She starts developing worsening encephalopathy, which is concerning for uh, evolving intracranial hypertension. And then as we work her up, she is diagnosed with uh, severe tylenol induced acute liver failure. And then things get worse. She develops worsening uh, encephalopathy and gets intubated for airway protection. <laughs> and then, uh, as you can expect in severe acute liver failure, the INR gets worse. It goes up to greater than 10, becomes undetectably high. Uh, and this is happening despite a decrease in the transaminases, which is ominous. You, she has no liver to even necrose anymore. And then she develops severe hypoglycemia, which is one of the last things to go. And at this stage, we would like to consider her for liver transplant, but she has some potential psychosocial barriers. And so now we are thinking about non-transplant ways to support a failing liver. And this is when we started support, artificial liver support with the MARS system. And we'll, we'll talk about the MARS system in some detail in the next uh, 20 minutes. And the remarkable thing about this story is that we kept her going for four days in an antipatic state. Um, and eventually, luckily for her, we were able to clear the barriers for transplant, and we, uh, we were able to give her successful transplantation. And I just saw her in clinic a few months ago, and she's doing great. The other thing that's remarkable about this story is that if you look at the explant from, from her um, intrinsic liver, it was hard to find a functional hepatocyte on this slide. And so it just further reiterated the, uh, the um, the remarkable nature of this case, we're able to support somebody uh, for four days uh, without uh, any hepatic function at all. And this is just one example of many that we've done so far. So this case about four years ago, but we've done this time and time again. Um, 
in particular with bridging folks with severe keloid failure to liver transplant. All right, so with that case as a background, the outline will be number one. I want to just briefly talk about the rationale in 2017 to justify the need for extracorporeal liver support. And then we'll briefly, f especially for the residents in the crowd, talk about classification of liver failure. Uh, and that, I think, is important as we try to see where artificial liver support fits into these two forms of liver failure. So we'll talk about ALF, acute liver failure, and acute and chronic liver failure. And then we'll just a brief word about the current modalities for the sake of time. I will not go into all the modalities. We'll focus on artificial liver support, but just uh, I'll give you the different categories. And then finally, I'll finish off with a, uh, with a few thoughts about where this field is going. So why do we need to think about artificial liver support in 2017? And this is data from UNOS, the federal database in 2016. And what I, what I want to highlight here is the tremendous discrepancy between the number of potential transplant recipients and the number of donors that are available to supply those number of organ recipients. So there's almost a tenfold decrease when you compare recipients to potential donors. And because this massive discrepancy, you have a lot of folks dying on the wait list. And this is for all organ systems, about 18 to 20 die per day on the wait list. If you extrapolate this data to liver transplant, the estimate is about 25 to 30 folks are dying on the wait list because of the organ shortage. Therefore, as we address this, this tremendous supply-demand mismatch, we have to think about strategies that either A, can facilitate hepatic recovery, and that is a potential possibility in folks with acute liver failure, where they don't have chronic disease, if you support that Tylenol overdose for X amount of time, you can create a window of opportunity for that liver to regenerate and go back to square one. So I think that's option A. Option B is stabilizing those six cirrhotics who have already have chronic liver disease and, the, and their fibrosis isn't going anywhere, to keep them stable on the wait list and prevent them from dying as they await subsequent liver transplant that is curative. So as you think about options A and B, I think this is where there is an opportunity to think about artificial liver support um, as a curative measure in ALF, in acute liver failure, or as a bridge to transplant in particular in acute and chronic liver failure. So just a brief word, I've alluded to ALF and ACLF, so what do these terms mean for those of you who haven't uh, thought about liver failure in a while. ALF, or acute liver failure, is strictly defined as acute hepatic dysfunction in the absence of chronic liver disease. And a good example of this is that a young patient rolls in with a tunnel overdose. The potential good news about these patients is if you can stabilize them for X amount of time, they have the potential to regenerate their liver back to a normal hepatic function. So that is ALF. Acute on chronic liver failure, another way to think about it is decompensated cirrhosis, is what we see all the time, more commonly. And that is decompensation of pre-existing portal hypertension. Example is a hepatitis C cirrhotic. And here, if you have an acute insult that does not result in the resolution of the underlying fibrosis uh, or, and, or underlying hepatic dysfunction, and here, the goal is to stabilize that meld of 35 with a goal to get them eventually to liver transplantation. So as I as you reflect on these two forms of liver failure, um, I, 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 um, I mentioned these with a goal to uh, think about how we superimpose extracorporeal liver support in these two specific contexts. All right, let's switch gears again. Let's talk about me mechanistic rationale. And I'm using the acronym ECLS, that's extracorporeal liver support. So here's the schematic. So you have a liver that can d develop a, an insult, an acute insult. It could be acute liver failure, such as a Tylenol overdose. It could be acute on chronic liver failure, ACLF, such as a decompensated hep C cirrhotic, or you can have acute alcoholic hepatitis. So three examples of an acute insult in the liver. When this happens, there are uh, the accumulation of specific toxins that are hepatic in origin, if you will, that are different from toxins that accumulate in renal failure, for example and we'll go over this in some detail. And there are two negative downstream effects of these to this toxin accumulation. Number one, it can lead to multi-organ system failure. And we see this all the time in the cirrhotic. You can develop severe hepatic encephalopathy. You can develop severe distributed shock. You can develop hepatorenal syndrome, uh, induced acute kidney injury. 
and as these number of organ system derangements accumulate that can lead to worsening uh, um, survival um, and so a multi organ system failure is one downstream uh, negative effect the second uh, effect can be the inhibition of potential hepatic recovery and so you impair uh, hepatic regeneration, and this becomes important, especially in acute liver failure. So if you were to come along and create a system that can extract these toxins with an extracorporeal liver support system, you can have a dual benefit, number one, of, of mitigating multi-organ system failure and thereby improving survival, and number two, uh, improving potential hepatic regeneration. So with a combination of artificial liver support and aggressive critical care management, we have made progress with regard to stabilizing all these acute hepatic dysfunctions, and I'll share with you some of that data from our center. So just to capsulize that first part of the conversation, you're starting with liver failure. We have defined two forms of liver failure, ALF versus ACLF. And as you think about the role of extracorporeal liver support in these two specific forms of liver failure, in the setting of ALF, you can either bridge them to intrinsic recovery or you can bridge them if the damage is too far gone to liver transplant. And we've done both of these um, uh, forms at Emory. In, this, in the chronic setting, when they already have a cirrhotic, we have successfully bridged folks to temporary stabilization. So take that melt of 35, bring them down to 30, prevent them from dying, and eventually bridge them to life-saving liver transplantation. All right, so just a brief word, switching gears again. Two forms of extracorporeal liver support. We'll focus today on artificial liver support. And under, under that category, you have the MARS system, which stands for the Molecular Adsorbent Recirculating System. Uh, I would think of it as an albumin dialysis system. Um, and number two is high volume plasma exchange. And this is exciting data. We did our first case a couple of weeks ago with regard to high volume plasma exchange, which I'm pretty remarkable. Uh, effects, I want to share that with you as well. So we'll focus our attention on these two forms. Just for the sake of completion, there is another evolving form of liver support, which is called bioartificial, i.e. you actually have hepatocytes in the extracorporeal circuit. And this is an, as part of a phase three study that is happening currently, and Emory is one of the sites, uh, looking at using the ELAD system in severe alcoholic hepatitis. So we won't talk about the ELAD system, which is a form of bioartificial. We'll focus on the artificial support system. So let's sort of dive into MARS. Um, and this is a schematic on the left of the MARS membrane. So as you f reflect on this diagram, I would draw a contrast to CRT, uh, renal dialysis. So just to orient you here, here's the patient's plasma with the, um, the, the, the albumin molecules flowing this way. 